and the, this is kind of the fun part, the SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So strengths and weaknesses are things that are internal to your business, that are unique to you. What are your abilities and limitations uh, in terms of the manager and the key employees? What about your physical facility? Is it modern and efficient? What about your soil, if you're growing directly in soil? How close are you to the market? What do you do better than the competitors? And what's the cash flow position of the firm? So those are some things that are internal to you, strengths and weaknesses. Opportunities and threats are things that are external to the business. So things that will impact your business, but you don't have as much direct control over, like market trends, uh, consumer trends, demographics, lifestyle, whether you have a strong or weak currency, interest rates, in inflation, government policies, and then the labor market. So those are things that are going to impact you in a very direct way, but you have less control over. So I want to go over just some examples. Um, and we will be sending you out um, an email handout that somehow didn't get in the packet today with some blanks on each one of these categories. Um, but I, I think I find it useful to subdivide strengths and weaknesses into the different <coughs> categories like financial, personnel, and so forth. So I just want to go over some examples that I thought about to sort of trigger something for you. I find examples help. Um, your business obviously will be different, but hearing some of these may make you think what yours is. Okay. So um, in terms of, again, I'm trying to break this down financially, uh, I mean, by different categories. So financial, one strength in this particular example, that in this example, you follow through that in the workbook. I've tried to build on this same family throughout the workbook. The business doesn't have to support the family because John has an off-farm job, which is a huge advantage. Um, and I've you know, counseled some other farmers in New Jersey. Often having a spouse with some benefits and off-farm income is a, you know, a real saving grace in the early years of struggling to get a business started. The weakness is their net worth is all tied up in the greenhouse, which is already 30 years old and is rapidly depreciating. Okay. Marketing. A strength is that it's located with outside a city that boasts three supermarkets that could be possible wholesale customers. The weakness is if they move into direct marketing, this is a new venture that they don't have a customer base for. They bought an existing business, and, but you know, it's, an, it's a transition, so they, they don't have any experience in this area and they would have to create, uh, find new customers. In terms of profit, a strength is that John's job is providing money to live on, so the greenhouse has the luxury of building the business long term. <coughs> Weakness is that it's a wholesale business, so the profit potential isn't as high as if you're doing retail, and it's a fairly small greenhouse. The personnel, um, a strength is that children can help out after school for now, and the family's very much behind Mary's plan to start this business. A weakness is that labor is the largest cost. That's pretty much true of all greenhouse businesses, around 30 to 35 percent. And it's going to be even higher in three to four years when the children go off to college, and more, neighbor, more labor would have to be hired once they're in college, and of course then they're going to be paying college tuition. So it's a new business and it takes time away from activ activities that the family's done before. So now their hobby is going to be this greenhouse, their family time. Production. A strength is they're surrounded by enough flat land that uh, agri-entertainment options are possible and they could be considered, including pick your own pumpkins, Indian corn, haunted houses, corn mazes, and things like that. Um, that's not generally just greenhouse, but yes, we see more and more combinations of those. Uh, in direct marketing organizations, uh, businesses. And the weakness is facilities are old and they limit mechanization. In terms of sales, she the strength is that she's bought an existing business, so there is a customer base which she can draw from. A weakness is it's only a half an acre and the previous owner sold wholesale and only during the bedding plant season, so she's going to have to extend that season and uh, she doesn't have a sales base yet for that part of the business. The facilities, the strength is there's a small barn not in use that could have potential for a roadside stand if she wants to do direct marketing. It's highly visible, she's on a heavily traveled road, and she could put out window boxes and other displays to encourage people to um, buy her product. 
weakness. The green, greenhouse, as I mentioned, is 30 years old, so it's in fair condition at best, and it's in need of modernization and repair. Okay, so hopefully that will just give you some ideas to think about how you apply those to your business. So that's internal to the business, the, the strengths and weaknesses part. The opportunities and threats are external, so I divided these into some categories too, the first being cultural and demographic. So an opportunity, there's a lot of two-income families with high disposable income in the area. And consumers are sophisticated and they want new and different material, not just what the big box stores offer. A threat is the two-income families don't have much time to garden. So, um, you know, it's a lot of these things, there's a double-edged sword. A strength can also be a weakness. Market and globalization trends, uh, an opportunity. People want a shopping experience. That's why direct marketing, corn mazes, all that stuff is really popular because, you know, very few people are in farming anymore. When I grew up in a rural area in Kentucky. Everybody was a farmer. Now people look at me when I say I'm in, you know, New Jersey and I'm working with farmers. It's like, we have farmers in New Jersey? So it's really unique, um, even though we are the garden state. So consumers are looking for a shopping experience and farming is kind of cool to them. It's, it's so, we're so many generations removed from farming for most people that it is an experience to go into a greenhouse and see how plants are grown. And the, the whole, that trend was happening anyway, but with the recession of 2008, uh, people are still interested in getting to know their farm or getting to know local. So that all plays into this sort of a little growth spurt in agriculture now. For years we were decreasing in the number of farms in New Jersey. We've actually been increasing a little bit in the last couple of years. So, so farmer, uh, consumers are really interested in buying local and buying green, which helps us producing here in New Jersey because we don't have advantages in terms of cost of production. We have high land, high labor, um, but we have the people. A threat, the increasing number of supermarkets and warehouse stores that sell plant material from other states and countries where they have lower cost and favorable exchange rates are pushing prices down. And consumers are not, even though we're technically out of the recession, people are still hesitant to buy too much. Okay, in terms of input cost, uh, low cost producers are making purchasing standard size plants really cheap. That's what has happened to the poinsettia business. And they allow small producer, but an opportunity is you can buy poinsettias or some other cheap product from a competitor and resell them to your producers or to your customers, sorry. <coughs> as long as you're careful about the quality and it fits your market profile. A threat, par profits are declining as labor costs increase. So we were having a growth period for years and years through the 70s, 80s, 90s, but we're sort of stagnant now in the greenhouse industry. At least the floriculture part. I think the vegetables are sort of on an uptick and that's reflected in several of you who are interested in vegetable production. Technology. Uh, communications technology is improving and becoming less costly. A threat is if it's hard for you to produce and compete with a large producer if you're small and if you're not into the social media thing you're going to be left behind so it kind of forces you to learn it. Uh, in terms of regulations, an opportunity, customers may want to learn about biological pest control and buy plants that use less pesticides. A threat, as you know if you've been in the business, minor use pesticides um, are being removed from the market and are coming under pressure and becoming harder to buy and harder to register as these costs are being passed along to the consumers. So we're sort of forced to go sustainable and or uh, predators and things like that that we'll talk about with other speakers. Government programs, legislation, political, how does that impact you? Well, an opportunity, there's increasing demand for native. Deer resistant is big in New Jersey. If you've got anything deer resistant, drought tolerant, environmentally friendly, those are all things people are looking for. If you have those, um, those appeal to consumers. A threat is they're reluctant. Some customers in certain parts of the state are reluctant to buy anything because deer will eat pretty much anything and they don't want to keep buying salad for deer. Uh, the political climate is uh, resistant to increased hunting to reduce the deer population. So in certain parts of the state that's really tough. Questions to ask is what production levels do you have right now and what do you want to achieve? 
What about your location? Is it suitable for direct marketing? Is direct marketing something you want to do? How much land do you own or have access to? Can you rent extra land if needed? What machinery and uh, facilities do you have? How old is uh, the machinery and is what's the condition? Can you use it in a different way? What's the financial condition of the firm? This is a big one. What about your cash flow position? A lot of businesses are profitable but can still go out of business because of cash flow problems because, again, you have to shell out a lot of money up front before you get the income from your customers. So you need to plan a source of cash flow uh, operating capital. What are the skills of the manager and the owner and other people in the business? Do your current skills limit what you can do? Uh, if so, can you hire other people to supplement your talents? We tend to always want to be surrounded by people just like us, but probably a wiser thing is to complement what you have, your talents, and, buy, and get somebody that has expertise that you don't have. What are some marketing and production opportunities for your business? Um, do your personal preferences or sense of, sense of social responsibility limit those? For example, there's some, some of the greenhouse owners in the state are from the Netherlands and they're from the, the Dutch Reformed Church and they're very religious and don't want to open on Sunday. If you're going to be a direct marketer, you can sell a lot of plants on Sunday, but that, if that's not something you want to do, just you know, be aware of that and um, you can work around that sell other days of the week, but those are things to be aware of. Can you form alliances with other businesses that could complement yours? What market channels uh, are possible for you? Does the plan that you put into place have require more competence than you have? And if so, where can you get that competence? What about your employees? What are their skills and talents? They're working with the plants probably more than you are. Bring them into the table. Who are the family members that are involved in the business? Are they supportive and what are their talents and interests and are they bringing those into the business? What about the next generation? That's key if you're gonna keep this business going. And there are uh, programs in this state and others to partner people. If you don't have anybody that wants to take over the business, there's a lot of young people that wanna get into farming. So there's linkages, uh, I think we may be covering that later, to pair up with somebody to transfer the business to another um, owner in the, when you want to retire. What about the layout of the farming operation? A lot of times people start in the greenhouse business or any business as a hobby and then it sort of grows and, it's, and it wasn't planned to be as big as you end up being so it's not so efficient. And some of the more profitable businesses that I've known have actually just sold that and moved down the road and were able to build a new facility that was much more efficient. Uh, do you have a good water supply that's cost effective? That's key in uh, greenhouses that you know you're pro you're producing a higher volume of crops than other types of farms so you need a lot of water and, and a good source that's economical and dependable so <clears throat> so we did all that going through our strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats to look at what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses how can we match those to the external opportunities and threats <coughs> what are the key factors for success and how can I magnify my strengths and overcome those weaknesses? So then, once you go through that whole uh, SWOT analysis, then you can look at some alternatives, maybe one, two, probably two or three alternatives that you wanna go for the business, and then look at each of those alternatives and what are the objectives, match your strengths and weaknesses to the opportunities, opportunities and threats. Again, go back to what are your core competencies what gives you a competitive advantage? And no matter what you're doing, you know, reducing cost is pretty much the name of the game now because of competition. Um, so just looking at some of the key businesses in the state, I just want to go through some of the strategies that they're employing. Again, I mentioned your competitive advantage. What, what are you doing different and unique from other people? Uh, listen to the customer. And everybody says they do this, but most people really don't. You know, what is it the customer wants and can you grab something from that that you can utilize? Uh, I think the next, next week we're talking about costs. So knowing your cost, knowing um, 
then what kind of profit do you have to have to stay in business? And the key is knowing your cost. How can you control cost? Well, some examples are not hiring people that you don't need, but trying to maintain your key workforce so that you have dependable employees. I've been looking at this business for 30 years now, and I found that consistently the people that pay the highest wage per hour have the lowest total labor cost because they treat people well, they don't have as much turnover. Um, I'm not saying run out and give everybody a raise and then you all of a sudden will be profitable, but it all goes with that attitude and uh, sort of building a successful team that everybody is involved, knows your mission, is on board with it and are happy and excited to come to work every day and who doesn't want to work with plants? Um, here's one example, you know, we had, a, energy is always a tricky thing in the greenhouse and a few years ago it went up the roof. So uh, Ari Van Voot at Plainview Growers decided to grow his own fuel and it was a good compliment because he had this land surrounding his greenhouse. He grew switchgrass. He harvested and stored it in the empty greenhouses during the winter and as he burned it then he, you know, the bedding plant started to fill up the greenhouse. So, um, and we looked at the economics. It's, it's really, it was very profitable for him to replace the fuel he's buying. It's not so profitable to sell it as a fuel to other people because of the transportation costs, but because he could grow it right there on site, it was a solution for him. And that was just sort of an innovation out of a problem that came up with the energy costs being going up so quickly there around 2008, 2007. Uh, we always say in economics that diversity is the key. I think in the greenhouse industry, we probably take this too far and we grow too many different crops. So be careful, you know, if you grow so many, you're, you're too distracted. If you grow only one thing, you can be very efficient, but if that market collapses or if you have some kind of pest or disease that hits, it's, it is risky. So I would say more than one crop, but not a hundred, somewhere, you know, in between. Um, again, going back to Plainview Growers, um, he came up with growing pet greens and he let me use his um, pictures here. And as you know, people that own pets will pay just about anything for their pet. And I said, how do you come up with all these ideas, Ari? And he said he brainstorms with his um, employees and they throw out a lot of ideas and most of them don't fly, but occasionally one really sticks. So again, employee, I think people are the key, your customers, your business partners and your employees without people you don't really have a business and so, you know, we spend most of our waking hours at work so it needs to be a fun place that everybody wants to come to that they're willing to, to use their brain and help you out there. Bigger is not necessarily better. You need to right size the operation. And so many times I've seen successful businesses just assume that bigger is better and they get bigger and what happens is they're still making the same profit they did when they're smaller and it's not as fun anymore. And you're just working harder for the same amount of money. So that's where planning is good. You know, do these projections and make sure that that's really where you wanna go. Small businesses have a lot of flexibility that you kinda of lose when you get to be middle size. And what I've seen is small businesses generally tend to be pretty profitable and so do large ones and that middle size can be very tricky. I'm not saying there aren't some middle sized businesses that are profitable, but you have to go the, from the transition from being an entrepreneur to a manager. And a lot of times the person that founded the business can't make that transition. You have to let go of a lot. And that's hard to let go of your baby that you created uh, and pass that off to somebody else. And the other thing I think in the transition you're big enough that you can't do it all yourself anymore, but you're not really big enough to hire a whole new grower or manager or whatever. So it's a really tricky transition to get through. And so I think that's part of the reason that middle size is, is difficult. And if you get past that and get to be bigger, then it's good. But remember early on I talked about your social um, values and where you wanna be. That's another thing that's important to look at is, do you wanna get bigger? You want to also evaluate your pricing strategies. There's all different ones. There's a sheet in the workbook that lists some different ones. Uh, you can drop prices. You can store your product until prices go up. That's kind of hard to do with a perishable product. You can't store it too long. You can destroy product rather than reducing the price. Or you can add value to increase prices. I remember I did a consulting job um, 
in New York several years ago now, and it was one of those rainy springs where it was raining every weekend. And if any of you are flower growers, you know what happens when it's rainy. Well, it happens, nothing sells. People don't come and buy things. So the plants got really tall, really stretched. Instead of throwing them out, you know what they did? They cut their bedding plant flats down and they grew them back out and they put them into uh, container gardens. So they basically turned something that could have been a loss into a value added product. So that's what I call, you know, making lemonade out of the lemons. So there's, just like with Ari and his biofuels, a lot of times at crisis, you come up with something that can be very innovative and profitable. Like I said, weather can be a bigger factor than the economy in this business. Uh, some things you can do are add services for retailers. You can add delivery, packaging, advice, uh, quality, value, convenience, or selection. For wholesalers, you want a user-friently website, point of sale per, uh, materials, pre-pricing programs, online ordering, er early paying discounts, quantity discounts, and frequent delivery. So those, you know, you can, the list can go on and on, but just some ideas to, to toss out there. A lot of uh, businesses are integrating horizontally, and I mentioned that before, spreading your fixed cost over more output. So very few greenhouses anymore are just a greenhouse. They may have Christmas trees, uh, flowering potted plants, vegetables in the summer, spreading out so they have year-round income. Again, I think diversification is good, but don't over-diversify. I think some of us can go too much in that direction. You can also vertically integrate, so going up and down on the supply chain. 43% of New Jersey farmland is engaged in some kind of agritourism. It's a $57.5 million business in New Jersey. So, uh, but that requires more labor, more talent, a whole different um, set of skills and resources. Um, benchmark your cost against the industry standard. Um, and there aren't a lot of benchmarks readily available in the industry because not many greenhouses are C corporations. If you're a C corporation, your information is public. If you're not a C corporation, it's not. So there aren't many records out there. So the best benchmark is benchmarking against yourself. Every year, look at all your financial ratios and compare where you were last year to where you are now and project where you're going in the future. We're gonna talk about that next week as well. Uh, partnership is becoming key. You notice those little pink ribbons, everybody's partnering with cancer research. So there's, there's lots of ways of finding partners with uh, other producers, with suppliers, with companies that produce or market inputs. You probably don't wanna be in the lowest price market. I mean, we do have um, greenhouses that are wholesalers and wholesaling to the big box stores, but you have to be very willing to know that that's competing on price. Um, and there's usually somebody else that can knock you out of the ball game and, and go lower. So mostly what we find is we're doing some um, selling to not the lowest price market, either direct to consumers or to garden centers or something a little bit higher value. Uh, people are grading and offering products to different prices. I remember when I was at Penn State, there was a, a flower shop that was very effective in Pittsburgh. And they had two different flower shops in two different parts of town and two different kinds of consumers. One was, you know, at that time, very monochrome colors, very upscale. The other was sort of in an ethnic market with all the bright colors. And, you know, they really knew who their market was and what those, those people wanted. And they were both successful, but they were totally different um, flower shops keyed to those two different markets. So you want to grade your products and, and not send your seconds into a high uh, value market. Uh, and again, with the economic downturn, the, unfortunately, the worse the economic times are, the better the quality has to be. Uh, one of the things that, well, actually, the agency that's funding us is risk management, and that's reducing the risk. One of the key ones we want to reduce is production risk, and uh, there is crop insurance now for greenhouse crops, but there's also um, you also want to look at insurance on your greenhouse facility, fire, wind, hail, and liability. It's a biggie with, in the U.S. Uh, look at pesticide management, IPM, 
sustain, more sustainable systems. Look at your cash flow, make sure you have a line of credit or some other source of funding to carry you through. Do you have life insurance? Uh, disability insurance. Agriculture is one of the most risky businesses there is, so um, disability and life insurance are important if you have other people involved at all in the business. Uh, health insurance is a key, and estate plans. Okay, people that are successful in the business offer unique products, and what are the unique benefits of those products? Well, and is it real or Perceived, it doesn't matter if the customer perceives it, but things to look at are appearance, performance, price, versatility, durability, speed, accuracy, ease of installation if you're selling plants outdoors, uh, ease of training, ease of use, cost of maintenance. More and more people, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They want you to do things for them. So this is um, offered a lot of uh, potential for people producing flowers. Um, the first group of Suzanne's project people that I taught in Turkey gave me this little bouquet of flowers and I put this on here because I think it shows value added very well. Instead of just a flower, they put a bunch of flowers together, they put that lace on it, they tied a ribbon, put little fake pearls, and they even put a little fake beetle on the plant. So that's, you know, they added a lot of value and made, made it very unique and cute. Uh, find a niche market that other people aren't serving. Now this is tricky because once you figure out something that's successful, other people want to copy it. And one of the most successful greenhouses I worked with when I was in graduate school in North Carolina, the guy that owned it said to me, I, I'll tell you anything you want to know because by the time everybody else figures it out, I'm on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to think of is, you know, if you find something that's great, it's not going to take long before other people figure it out. So you've always got to be thinking and moving ahead. And you want to look at the whole system, not just the components. Improve the profit. Also, a lot of people just want to get bigger, if they're, especially people that aren't doing well. Somehow that's the solution of, I'm just going to get bigger and solve the problem. And you know what happens? You just multiply the problems. So if you're having problems small, you want to fix them before you get bigger and then think about getting uh, bigger. Think of ways to eliminate debt or restructure the debt. Look at financial management, reduce cost, and increase profitability. We mentioned risk management before, can go into details, but all the different in insurances. Uh, do you have a retirement <coughs> plan? Most farmers don't because you know what? We love our jobs, we're gonna live forever, and we're not gonna retire. Um, but if you have people children that you want to pass it on to, it's important. Uh, do you have crop insurance? Is it enough or is it just cat coverage? Do you have an estate plan? Do you have production alliances, uh, cooperatives, suppliers, and so forth? Are there any other site issues such as pesticide storage? Do you have an underground tank that's going to cause you trouble with the government? Uh, fuel storage, concerns from neighbors. I know uh, some greenhouse, one greenhouse in particular that spent a lot of money just building a hedge so the neighbors didn't have to look at the greenhouse. Um, so you can usually s eliminate some of these conflicts with non-farming neighbors by tr being a, a good neighbor and addressing any kind of issues before they happen. So a business plan helps you look at that big picture, look at your core competencies. What is it that you have that is a competitive advantage? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are the external forces that are going to impact you negatively or positively? Uh, take advantage of the business trends and align your firm to the market situation. So again, we have listed the ag plan here and I mentioned um, the market to market book. So any questions? you think you can do a SWOT analysis. And one of the key things we do each week that we meet is share our homework with each other. So next week we'll be sharing mission statements and SWOT analysis. Anything? Yeah, we'll share next So you have a little bit of time now to start working on your SWOT analysis, maybe while these ideas are fresh in your mind, and then take it home, work with other people.